Hello, Health 230 students. This is lecture two of two on chapter number 26. We will pick back up with ketoacidosis. And um, I, I'll just start, uh, start anew from this slide. Um, ketoacidosis is caused by a severe lack of insulin. And there's a couple different ways that can happen, um, either when a person is, is having uh, the autoimmune response that ultimately ends up killing the beta cells or um, there could be other situations as well uh, after a person has been diagnosed with type 1 um, we'll talk about that, those the multitude of things that can cause a severe lack of insulin here in just, just a moment but um, ketoacidosis can develop very quickly and ultimately what occurs is uh, due to the fact that there's that there is a severe lack of insulin. The body doesn't have any energy, doesn't have any glucose to to utilize. Um, or I, I shouldn't say doesn't have any glucose to utilize. It cannot utilize the glucose that it has because of the lack of insulin. And thus, the body needs energy. It has to get its energy somewhere. And luckily, we have this backup system of, uh, of utilizing or breaking down triglycerides. And when that happens, the fatty acids that are released from the adipose tissue make their way into the blood and uh, this is a it's a wonderful backup system in the fact that we do have this this energy source that can be used it's not a great system in that it causes the pH of the blood to, to decrease dramatically that of course increases acidity Uh, you're usually going to see this situation of ketoacidosis or um, the situation of, of ketoacidosis when a person's blood or when a person's blood glucose concentration exceeds 250 milligrams per deciliter and of course it can rise dramatically higher than that uh, this, this next little bullet point is one worth p pointing out considering that most of you all are planning on going into a clinical field um, uh, there is something something very simple that can be done to help offset the, the consequences of acidosis and that is simply hyperventilation uh, our body has this wonderful buffering system where we have HCO3 negative circulating in our blood and um, chemically speaking that is nothing more than baking powder uh, or, or pardon me, baking soda. You know, Arm & Hammer baking soda. As you look at that white powder, that is pure HCO3 negative. And we have the exact same chemical, and I, and I probably shouldn't call it a chemical, um, the, the exact same compound circulating in our blood. And that allows for a buffering or absorption of hydrogen ions. And of course, the hydrogen ions are or, or, or the atomic particle responsible for making the blood acidic. So um, we have this, um, this this binding of protons or hydrogen atoms or hydrogen ions, pardon me, to this HCO3 negative within the blood, and that gives us H2CO3. And a very simple uh, reaction can occur once that H CO3 negative, I'm sorry, H2CO3 makes its way to the lungs. And, and uh, don't worry, I, I don't think that the, the questions are going to get into quite this level of detail. But um, it is important that you know that we have this system in place. And ultimately what happens is that um, once the H2CO3 makes its way to the lungs, it can uh, that that H2CO3 can be blown off in the form of H2O and carbon dioxide, and that's of course nothing um, nothing harmful. Uh, we exhale water all the time. We exhale carbon dioxide all the time. There's no uh, negative health effects to doing that. So um, simply by having a person participate in hyperventilation or deep breathing that can minimize the effects of ketoacidosis. Now when ketoacidosis does occur that is going to cause significant dehydration and when dehydration occurs there's also going to be depletion of electrolytes in particular uh, depletion of potassium and that's 
that's a big deal because potassium is needed for muscular contraction. And um, every time that a muscle contracts, there's sodium going into an individual cell, potassium going out. As the cell relaxes, just the opposite occurs. And if in the event that you do not have adequate amounts of potassium in the blood, then things like heart cell contraction does not occur. And that can result in cardiac arrest. Some, um, some signs or, or symptoms, uh, fruity, fruity breath or acid, what's, what's called acetone breath, lethargia, weakness, nausea, vomiting. A uh, person may be confused. And as I said a few moments ago, it can be caused by a multitude of things, but ultimately uh, it's a situation where a person does not have an adequate amount of insulin in their, their blood. All right, let's move on to hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. And this is seen in type 2, develop, type two diabetes. Uh, can develop very slowly um, over days or weeks. And uh, we see this occurring when blood glucose levels exceed 600 milligrams per deciliter. That's going to cause the same type of fluid loss that we saw in ketoacidosis. So um, you're going to get that same electrolyte imbalance. Once again, this can cause neurological abnormalities, basically causes the person to become confused. Uh, there can be abnormal reflexes, motor impairment. 10% of the patients will lapse into a coma and um, that can be, be caused by a handful of things, um, including infection, illness, uh, sometimes simply just drug treatment that impairs insulin secretion. Now, another condition occurs as well, hypoglyc or uh, let me clarify that, another condition occurs in diabetics that's called hypoglycemia or having blood glucose being too low, and that is going to occur because a person has too much insulin in their blood and of course when you are manually injecting uh, or, or and in some cases taking um, a tablet form of insulin uh, concentrations of insulin can be high enough to artificially push blood glucose levels to a, a low enough level where there are consequences to the brain and um, you know, just just physiology in general but in particular to the brain and um, yeah, that's going to cause confusion it's going to cause a person to, to, to just not be able to function in a normal in a normal manner I'll let you look over those that, that information is pretty straightforward let's talk about some of the chronic complications of diabetes uh, when when there is prolonged exposure to high glucose concentrations, and in, in particular, we're talking about um, we're talking about the blood. We're talking about uh, the, the vessels being exposed to a high glucose concentration for an extended period of time. Uh, you're going to get these uh, these little proteins that are called advanced glycogen end products, and um, they they cause arterial damage and over time that arterial damage is going to progress to arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis and um, uh, ultimately what that means is that blood is not not circulating as well through the body uh, which can result in peripheral, peripheral artery disease, can result in cardiovascular disease, can result in inadequate amounts of blood flowing to the brain. Um, it's also worth mentioning that excessive glucose promotes the production and accumulation of sorbitol, which we talked about, I believe, in the last chapter. Um, that's just simply pointing out that uh, that the damage can occur just about any, anywhere, whether it be macrovascular or microvascular. Um, can also cause neuropathy, cataracts glaucoma, and certain skin disorders. I'm going to skip forward. Those are very straightforward. Uh, it is also worth noting that people who have diabetes are at a dramatically higher risk of having ulcers on their periphery, such as their, their feet. Um, the reason this occurs is because there is poor Pardon me, there's poor circulation to the periphery of the body. 
and uh, you know, of course the feet take you know, quite a bit of uh, of pounding in a given day and uh, damage can very easily occur to the foot and um, considering that there is limited blood flow in people who, who have peripheral artery disease uh, the healing process is oftentimes very slow and uh, that can result in gangrene setting in and ultimately um, ultimately amputations being needed. Additionally some uh, or a type of damage that can occur is um, diabetic retinopathy and that is damage to the retina and of course that is the the, um, the very thin layer of cells that line the back of the eyeball that allow for light to be sensed. Uh, this is an interesting statistic. 80% of patients with diabetes will develop retinopathy by 15 years after diagnosis. And um, about the only way to prevent that is intensive management uh, of the of a person's glucose. Uh, it's, it's just as simple as if a person has elevated glucose levels for an extended period of time then retinopathy will occur. Another condition that occurs is diabetic nephropathy and that is simply damage to the kidneys and the, those very small vessels uh, that that have that are that are present in the kidneys that allow that allow for filtration of the blood. Uh, that's going to happen in later stages of, of type one as well as type two. But ultimately, um, end end stage renal disease will occur because the, the kidneys are not good at, um, at at replacing tissue. Now the liver that's another story. It does replace its own tissue fairly well, but the kidneys not so much. Um, when kidney kidney tissue is damaged, uh, it does not grow back. Uh, you see end stage renal disease occurring in somewhere between 30 to 35 percent of patients with type 1 diabetes. Now of course most of these people oftentimes have had it for a very long period of time and 20 percent of those with type 2 diabetes. Now, of course once again intensive management can help slow that down. Diabetic neuropathy nerve damage or nerve degeneration occurs in 50 percent of people with diabetes. Uh, the extent of the damage depends upon the severity and um, the duration of hyperglycemia. Treatment goals of diabetes first and foremost to maintain blood blood glucose levels within a desirable range not allowing it to get too high or too low to maintain healthy blood lipid concentrations and this is important because we, we all have a certain level of, uh, of buildup of cholesterol buildup over time however um, the the negative effects of, uh, of hyperglycemia on the arteries can exacerbate how lipids attach themselves to the arterial walls and ultimately can promote the rate at which uh, plaques form. Uh, weight management, but more than that, lifestyle. And if uh, if a person controls his or her lifestyle, is physically active, uh, the weight loss is usually going to occur. Also, controlling blood pressure that can also be that that can can be done through medication. All right, I'm going to need to stop here. Um, we'll pick back up with lecture three of three.